Hi, I'm Chris Kanich, and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Today, we're going to be talking all about read-write locks and bounded buffers. These are going to be really great examples of how we can use mutexes and condition variables to build primitives that are useful for synchronizing between different threads that are doing really common operations. So the first one we're going to be talking about are read-write locks. And it's really useful to think about this within the context of the example we had from last video talking about the balance in a bank account. And we're going to be adding to it, we're going to be subtracting from it, and let's just say we'll also be able to show the balance. We're going to ask, we're going to request that balance. In theory, if we're just showing the balance to somebody, anybody can see that at any one given point in time. So if I have this balance, and I say I've got a lot of different threads, and all of these different threads are trying to read that balance at any one given point in time, honestly, what I probably would like is for all of them to go through all at the same time without having to synchronize with each other. Like if one of these is reading and that read takes a little bit of time, somebody else should be able to read at the same time. But then the tricky part is, so if we have a write thread over here, if that write thread tries to come in, we gotta figure out for correct operation, what do we want to happen? If there's readers already and we try to write something, maybe some of them are gonna get different values and it's gonna be unexpected in some way, shape, or form. So if one other reader is currently in the critical section reading the values at any one point in time, we don't want our writer to come in. And obviously, we also, if we had two different writers, we wouldn't want those two writers to come in at the same time either. That would not be a good idea. What we'd eventually want is to say, okay, if one reader is coming in, that's okay. If two readers are coming in, that's okay. If n readers are coming in, they're all able to come in, and they might take a different amount of time to get from the beginning to the end, but kind of what we want to do is when any one reader comes in, we kind of want them to put up a sign that says, no writers allowed, and they're going to do whatever it is they need to do, and the first one that came in isn't the one that's necessarily going to be the last one out. What we want to have is an idea of no more readers are in this critical section. We want to kind of mark it as open for business again. What we need is for the first one kind of needs to close the door and not allow any other writers in. And the last one that leaves is going to open the door back up for anybody else who wants to come in that's going to be doing writing. So you can only start writing once all of the readers have finished their reading, but as many readers that want to, at the same time simultaneously, can enter that critical section. So let's build this with the code we've got on the left side of the screen. The easy ones for us to do here are writing, locking, and unlocking. So what we know here is that we have some write lock that is going to allow us to lock the entire data structure for reading or writing. So what this would mean is that whatever reading or writing of a balance or a file or whatever you're going to do, when you lock for writing, you're going to acquire that lock that is called the write lock, and when you unlock for writing, you're going to release that lock that you have for the write lock. Okay, that kind of makes sense. You know, that's not really surprising or confusing. But let's think about how we're going to lock and unlock this for reading. Here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. What we see here is that when we lock for reading, we're going to lock this thing that I called here the counter lock, which is really saying I need to manipulate my internal state that keeps track of, say, how many different readers are currently accessing this variable that's being protected by this read-write lock. So as soon as I have access to that counter lock, I can increase my counter, I can check my counter, and then I can lock the write lock if I am the first one that came in. So what we're getting here in this if statement is if I am the first writer, I want to make sure no, oh, if I am the first reader, I'm sorry, no writers are allowed in at the same time. And I'm going to acquire that write lock. What's really interesting here is that I'm acquiring it in a given thread, say this is thread one. Nobody said that if thread one acquires a lock, that thread one is the one that has to release it. Anybody is allowed to call release on that lock at any given point in time. That can be super confusing, but it can also be very powerful when we're trying to create something that's a little bit more complicated than a basic on, all on, or all off lock. 
Likewise, at the end of this call to lock for reading, we're going to unlock our counter lock because we no longer need to prevent anyone else from reading or writing that counter. That lock will be acquired and then really, really quickly released no matter what is happening with that reader. And likewise, so let's say we had two reader threads and no writer threads. Let's step through what would happen in this code. So the counter lock is gonna get acquired by the first reader thread. The read count is gonna go from zero to one. When the read count has hit one, it is going to say, okay, I'm gonna lock for writing. No one is allowed to write at all anymore. And then we're going to unlock our counter. So at this moment in time, the counter is unlocked and the write lock is locked. The nice thing here is that when that second reader comes in, the second reader is going to, is going to grab the counter lock so that nobody else can manipulate it at the same time. It's going to increment from one to two. And because read count isn't one anymore, it's going to not worry about this write lock. If we didn't have this check here, we would only allow one reader at a time, but we allow as many readers as possible. And then we unlock that counter lock so another reader can come in here and manipulate the number of readers available at that point in time. Likewise, we've got our unlock down here and it works almost exactly the same thing, but in reverse. The core idea here is really that we're locking our counter just like before, but we're seeing, okay, I'm going to decrement the number of readers. Here I'm gonna say, if I'm the last reader to leave the critical section, I should allow writers back in. So here they're going to unlock that. So even though this is almost certainly going to happen in a different thread, it's still going to be able to call that unlock. These individual locks aren't associated with threads, they're just associated with being on or off, required or not required. And then we let go of the counter lock there. So what's useful about this is that you can use it to keep track of any number of readers that all go into the same critical section, but only one writer is allowed in at any one given point in time. This code doesn't actually get used by anything. This is purely a library function, I guess you could call it. But if you wanted to say, give this program a main, it would be a fantastic idea to work through how that stuff works. Now let's switch over to the bounded buffer. Now this bounded buffer example is gonna be a little bit more complicated. And what we're learning here is really two things. One, bounded buffer is in general an incredibly important primitive to use in lots of producer consumer situations where you have multiple threads, maybe one of them is going to create jobs, then maybe one or more of them is going to consume those jobs and do those jobs. Bounded buffer allows us to keep track of a certain number of these jobs and just have as many threads as possible request a new job from the buffer. And if there's no jobs, they wait. And when there is a job, they get unblocked and they go grab it. This is a very, very useful primitive. Another very important part to this is that we're gonna be using condition variables to implement our bounded buffer in this example. Condition variables are the core primitive that you're gonna be using in the final homework to run the elevator simulator. This is a very challenging, but also kind of fun assignment. At least I like to think it's fun. A lot of students have had a good time with it in the past. But the core idea here is that you have to use these condition variables and they're not very intuitive the first time you use them, but they are one of the big workhorses of concurrent programming in C. So we want to get a good idea of how to use them. So really quickly as a very, very basic introduction to what's going on here, we've got our, uh, we're gonna initialize a mutex and every time you use a condition variable, it needs to be protected by a mutex. You're never gonna use a condition variable by itself. You're always going to use a condition variable in tandem with a mutex. So here we've got our mutex and I call it peak here because we're kind of using it to check the state of our system. And we wanna hold on to that log while we're checking the state of the system and while we're determining whether we need to do something new or not based on the value of that condition variable. And likewise, we've got two different condition variables for bounded buffer. One of them is going to be waiting for and signaling that something is not full. If we're the producer, we want to make sure that something is not full before we put new things into it. Obviously, if something is has a capacity of 10, we don't want to push something into it until it has gone from holding 10 things down to holding nine things. Once it's not full, then we want to add new things to it. And likewise, on the other side, the consumer wants to wait until the buffer is not empty. When the buffer is empty, they should just sit there and not do anything until they actually have some work to do, until something has shown up there. And the important thing is, if we have lots and lots of different threads that are all waiting, say we've got one producer and 10 consumers, we shouldn't have one of them grab 
the same job really, really quickly at the same time because they both got woken up by the operating system because a certain condition started showing up as true. One of the really tricky things about condition variables is that even though we're using a function call that is supposed to only wake one thread up at any given point in time, sometimes operating systems don't give us that guarantee. And so you're gonna see one programming paradigm in here that doesn't seem like it should be necessary, but is necessary based on the way that this API works. So fundamentally, when we use condition variables, there, there are two calls that we're going to care about. One of them is this pthread cond wait, and I'm just gonna call this wait, and one of them is this pthread cond signal, which I'm just gonna call signal. So signal just takes a reference to an individual condition variable, so we're gonna give it that, and wait is a little bit different. Wait is gonna take both a condition variable as well as a mutex. So fundamentally, what wait is going to do is it's gonna say, you, the thread that is calling this, must have the mutex in question that you are passing into cond wait, and you're going to ask the operating system, operating system, I have this lock, so I'm allowed to call this call to pthread cond wait. What I'm gonna ask you to do, operating system, is put me to sleep until someone somewhere else signals this condition variable. This one specific condition variable is going to be what I am woken up for. So something is not full is going to be woken up for that consume thread. That kind of makes sense. Like I'm telling the operating system, operating system, put me to sleep until this is not full. Once it's not full, wake me up because I need to do my work. Until then, I don't have anything to do. But then the tricky thing about this mutex here is that we can't strongly guarantee that between when you check your condition and the moment that you actually do the thing that you're supposed to do, that somebody else hasn't come in here and messed up the situation and say made the condition no longer true or somebody else actually got unlocked by the operating system and did their own task on it. Maybe they popped something out of that buffer before you had a chance to. So what we're doing with the mutex is saying, listen, when you grab this condition variable, Everything you're gonna do from checking all the way through to modifying something and releasing it needs to be protected by a mutex. So we need to kind of go into a critical section and here in consume, we're going to talk about it as from this mutex lock all the way down to this mutex unlock. Everything within here needs to be protected by this mutex, but we may need to go to sleep between when we acquire it and when we actually do our work. So what pthread cond wait is fundamentally going to do it's gonna do two things. One, it is going to release that mutex, and then it's going to sleep until this condition variable is signal. And when we receive that signal, so we're gonna sleep, then the third thing we're gonna do here is when we are woken back up by the operating system, the operating system is actually gonna wait for that mutex to become available. We don't see it in the code here, but that's absolutely what's going to happen. So we are going to reacquire, so we're gonna reacquire that lock and then continue through with whatever it is our code is supposed to do, and it will seem to us as the programmer as if nothing had happened. We grab the lock that we need, we test the condition that we care about, and then we do what we need to do, and because we're doing producer-consumer here, we're gonna signal that something is not full, just in case we were the first person to put something in there, one of the producers needs to say, ah, there, there's some empty space, I need to start doing my job again. And then I'm going to unlock and move on with my life. What's really, really useful is that as a programmer, what we care about here is just going through step by step by step and saying, I'm gonna lock this thing, I'm gonna check, I'm gonna wait for this condition, I'm gonna do what I need to do based on this condition, and I'm going to move on with my life. That's the way that we get to think as a programmer. And that imperative way of thinking is super, super useful, much easier than trying to keep track of everything else that's going on. Now, the, the tricky part to this is we're not just going to wait once, we're gonna wait, wait, and wait, and wait, and wait until the actual expression that we're checking for its truthiness is true and ready to be used for whatever it is we're gonna be doing next. It's completely possible that we call cond wait while we have that mutex, we release that mutex, we get put to sleep until we're not empty, we get woken back up, we get given that mutex, 
But still, between the start and the end of that entire operation, somebody else had made our condition not true. Then we might hit that while loop and it's gonna say, oh, count is still zero, so we still have to come into condition wait, which means we release the mutex and then we ask the operating system to put us to sleep until that condition variable gets signaled. And when that condition variable gets signaled, we wait to reacquire our mutex and then we continue with whatever code it is we're, we're working on. This is a really unfortunate, confusing component of using condition variables, but it's still an important thing that we need to keep track of because it can really sting us if we're not expecting it. So now that we've walked through consume, the call to produce here is absolutely symmetrical. We're gonna do the same exact set of things where we lock the mutex, we check to see whether our buffer is full or not. If our buffer is full, then we need to wait until it's not full and that's gonna put us to sleep, release our mutex, and when we get woken back up, we know two things. One, at least one other thread called signal on the not full condition variable, and we have access to that peak mutex. So the nice thing there is that if count is less than size, so we have some space, when we get to line 40, we know that the condition we care about, that count is no longer equal to size because that expression evaluated to false, and that we have access to that mutex so that we can safely manipulate this data that's probably shared among lots of different threads. So this code here also, like the read write lock, doesn't do anything, and it would be a great idea if you cloned this repository and messed around with those producer-consumer variables. I think this would be a fantastic thing to really commit to your head for any sort of technical interview you're gonna do based on systems and mess around with it in case you need to use it as part of a larger whiteboarding exercise where you're asked to do some efficient producer-consumer style algorithm. So that's what I've got for you today. Thanks so, for, so much for watching. Good luck on homework six, and I'll see you next time.